you as soon as possible, but it's my pleasure to introduce the man who needs no introduction, Mayor Bob Walker. Thank you so much. Oh. Nonpartisan group of people. <laughs> 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 At least, I, I don't know what. I'm, sure, I'm sure there's a lot of people here. But it's my great pleasure to one more time introduce Ron Barber. We, he and I have over the years worked closely together on many issues. And it's a great uh, pleasure for me to say he's been a deep friend of mine for years and years. And it's kind of nice to get Ron back here every two years campaigning so we have a chance. To all get around and, and thank him for all the great things that he's done for us uh, in Washington. And as I prepared myself for this little get together, I had those kinds of lists of things that Ron has done for us. But I want you to know that he is on the right side of some key issues for this community. He's on the right side for jobs and creating jobs, he's on the right side of the environment, he's on the right side of global interests. Uh, and doing the right things on a global basis. But I'm going to take this moment, because I see him there, to tell him how much I and how much we appreciate what he's doing for our men and women in the armed forces. And what he's doing... <laughs> what he's doing to support Davis Monson. Davis Monson needs us and we need Davis Monson. Yeah. And I'm going to end with my appreciation for what he's doing to keep the A-10 here in Tucson, Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> the Air Force it is the ugliest, most beautiful airplane <laughs> ever conceived by man. So it's my very, very great pleasure to introduce to you the man you know and love, the man we're going to take back to Washington because yes. he's done a great job for us right here, Ron Barber. like a little while since we had these gatherings. We had one in February 2012 when I first ran. When they, then we had another um, in June when I was elected. And then we had another one in August after the primary and another one on the election night. And then we waited 11 days before we could celebrate victory. So you guys have been with me for a lot of these gatherings. And I'm really glad to be with you again tonight. Yeah, thank you. We won't have four elections in a row this time. That's 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 guaranteed. Thank goodness for that. We're really happy uh, that we can have just uh, really one or two. But we'll we'll be looking forward to the, uh, the election in November. And the, there's a few people, a couple, three people who joined me up here who I think many of you know. I just want to introduce them. Uh, my daughters are out of town today. Dad, we're so sorry we had this planned trip, so they're not here. But my <laughs> wife, who, my beautiful wife Nancy, is here. And we all like to be here. And uh, my grandchildren, this is Tilly, and this is Ailsa Douglas, who are uh, my uh, daughter Jenny's children. And uh, we're so pleased that they could be with me. They've been with me all the way throughout, although. Ailsa was kind of a little bit younger, weren't you, too? And you were, let's see, two years ago, you were how old? Five. Yeah, but you remember it, don't you? Okay. Well, I'm really happy to have them here, but also happy to have uh, all of you in the room as well. And particularly, I want to acknowledge a few people before I say a few remarks. And, and those are the people who, uh, first of all, Mayor Walkup, who is my honorary co-chair at the last election, and uh, he's been such a friend and a person I really love working with. And really, thanks so much uh, for introducing me tonight to today, uh, Mayor Walker. But behind me, we have some uh, current, uh, former, and future members of our state legislature and other offices. And so let's see who's there on the far end. We, I will start with the, the newest player in the game, and that is Dr. Randy Fries, who is and I think many of you know that Randy 
uh, not only a great candidate, but the man who was very instrumental uh, on January 8, 2011 in saving lives and uh, attending to all of us who were brought to University Medical Center. And let's see who's next to him. Oh, well, where are we? Oh, uh, Senator Paula Bowd, former Senator oh. Paula Bowd. And uh, next to here, her is Don Jorgensen, the chair of our Pima County Democratic Party. Let's give it up for Don. And Bruce Wheeler, who I've known since we were, I don't know, a long time ago, seems like. But Bruce first ran for the House of Representatives in what year was that, Bruce? 1974. 1974. <laughs> we, are, we are dating ourselves a little bit. I'm glad he's back in the house. And uh, a really good friend, and one of my, my dearest, uh, I just love this guy, I think we all do, because of the work he's done uh, for foster kids and kids generally, and he's a man of great intellect and, and poetry as well, and that's Senator Dave Bradley. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, Representative Stephanie Mock, who is uh, a new member of the House of Representatives in Arizona. Stephanie, you know, Democrats, in a, when you're in the minority in the House, Representatives, or the State House, or Senate for that matter, you don't get to pass a lot of laws. But I'm really proud of one law that Stephanie initiated and is now part of our code. I think it is anyway. The governor signed it yet? Uh, and that is a law that changes the language in our, le in our various uh, laws about people with disabilities. You know, I worked in the field of developmental disabilities for many years, and one of the things I learned very early on from people with disabilities is don't call me by my disability. Call me by my name or who I am. And Stephanie took the lead and has changed the language across all of our legislation, all of our laws, to properly uh, talk about people with disabilities. So Stephanie, thank you for doing that. And let's talk one of the smilingest uh, members of the legislature you'll ever find. And she's got this great smile, lights up her room, but uh, she's also done an incredible job. Again, in a minority, it's not easy to get things done in any chamber. Uh, but Victoria Steele, uh, early on, led the charge to introduce legislation to uh, bring about a program that we've had in Tucson, uh, Pima County, for a long time, ever since the shooting, actually, and that is the mental health first aid legislation. Uh, I work on a similar concept in, in Congress, and I'm glad to say we got funding there too, $15 million at the national level, and Stephanie, Stephanie, uh, sorry, Victoria, <laughs> was able to accomplish that here in Arizona. So she brought about a quarter of a million dollars in appropriations for mental health first aid in Arizona. So thank you for that. <laughs> and thank you for that. And uh, news, like, what, how do you, what do you call your newsletter? I forget what it's called. The Farley called. Report. The Farley Report, which is very informative. <laughs> and people read it all the time, and friends of Farley are many, so I'm really happy to have uh, Steve with us today as well. And of course, uh, Mayor Walcup. And I don't know, have we missed anybody, staff, and I, and anybody else that I should be recognizing, an elected official, former elected official? If not, it's so far. Um, <coughs> So here we are, getting ready for one more round, huh? And I think many of you know that uh, I've uh, lived here since I was a kid, since I was almost 15. I came here with my dad, who was in the Air Force, to Davis Monson Air Force Base. And I, my roots go back a little way, uh, not as deeply as my wife's, however. She's a native, so I claim semi-native status from Nancy. Um, and. Uh, we met actually at, at Davis Monthan. So, uh, you know, uh, the mayor said a few things about Davis Monthan and my commitment to keeping it viable and uh, long term, hoping to reverse the proposal that the Air Force has made to divest the A 10, which I think would be a terrible uh, decision uh, for our troops in combat and certainly for our community here. But uh, in addition to having been raised uh, for a few years at Davis Monthan, where I lived, and cut a lot of lawns, earning pocket money, uh, before we had some better ideas about what you should grow in the desert. Uh, but I met my wife there, actually. We were at the teen club playing bumper pool, and uh, she claimed she beat me that day. I don't know, maybe she did. <laughs> but, but what I remember about that was I had a crush on her girlfriend. Her girlfriend's name was Beth, and I just had this 
big crush for her. Unfortunately, it wasn't mutual. Um, but she said, she was kind, and she said, I want to introduce you to somebody, my girlfriend, uh, Nancy. And that was the best thing that Beth ever did for me, is to give <laughs> British people Nancy. So I, I dumped job that went really well. So Nancy and I have been together, except for while I was overseas with my dad on, on, uh, when he was stationed in England. Um, and we've been married now uh, 47 years, 48 in June. Wow. We got married in the summer of love, but we were kind of clueless about what was going on. So, you know, we were pretty square. Kind of kids. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we raised our daughters here, um, Jenny and Chrissy. Uh, Jenny runs Second Street uh, Children's School, a wonderful preschool, and my <coughs> other daughter, our other daughter, Chrissy, is a nurse at UMC. Um, our sons-in-law both work in our community. We have deep roots here, and we really are dedicated to the well-being of this community and all of Southern Arizona. Um, my wife and I, as you know, Nancy and I ran a small business for a while. Some of you may remember Toy Trader Sorts Nest. How many of you remember that? A few of you. Nancy, every now and again, someone will come up to her about this tall and say, remember me? I was a little girl when I came to your store, you know, 30 years ago, whatever, and uh, a lot with their children now, yeah. So we ran a business for 22 years, and that really gave me some skills and knowledge that I think are pretty important in, in Washington, because you know, there are not too many people with small business backgrounds in Washington, and I'm proud to say that I can take that knowledge there and as a member of the Small Business Committee try to help our small businesses grow. And uh, also for 32 years I was the was involved with helping people with developmental disabilities move out of institutions and we closed two on my watch, I'm very pleased to say, we almost closed the third one. Uh, and we allowed people with disabilities to live in their communities. We supported them to stay with their families. We helped them get jobs. Uh, we, we restored their rights, which had been taken away from them by institutionalization over many decades. And that's uh, really one of the proudest times of my life, is being able to serve and support families with disabilities, and to help young families with kids with disabilities stay together and to learn and grow together. And then um, I met in the state legislature, I met this young woman, um, by the name of Gabby Giffords. She was in the House of Representatives and later in the Senate. And I have to tell you that there was no one in that legislature uh, that I, I admired more. Uh, when we had meetings with uh, constituents, her constituents, my, my clientele or customers, people with disabilities and their families, Gabby was the first person there and the last person to leave. She knew what she came to ask about. She had great questions, and she stayed and talked with those families when everybody else was gone. And I had such great admiration for someone who would be willing to do that. And uh, then uh, when Gabby decided to run for Congress in November of, December really of 2005, I had this, uh, this uh, idea, this light bulb went on, and. And I said, I came home to Nancy and I said, Good. you know, I think I'm going to quit my job and help this young woman, if I can, get elected to Congress. And Nancy said, so does that mean we're unemployed? I said, yeah, it kind of does. <laughs> but, you know, it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Uh, January uh, 8, 2011, notwithstanding. I, what, a, what an incredible inspiration she is to all of us, was then to me and still is. And she sets the bar very high. We were together just a few days ago, a couple days ago, over at Yuma, um, dedicating the courthouse to John Rowe, who was um, standing beside me when the shooting occurred back in January of 2011. She's an incredible inspiration on so many levels. And some of you may have heard me tell this before, but, but Gabby, you know, always set the bar very high for all of us who worked for her and for herself. And she always either met it or exceeded it. And, uh, on January uh, 8th, uh, three years after the shooting, this January 8th, she decided she was going to go skydiving. Yes. Yes. You've all read about that. And I saw her a few days later and I said, Gabby, you know, you've always set the bar high. I've always tried to emulate you, but I'm not jumping out of this <laughs> Oh, okay. that's not going to happen. And she said, oh, you, you. <laughs> and 
then a couple, three weeks later, she and Mark were down in Austin with a friend's wedding, and uh, uh, Mark wanted to go run around the, you know, race around the uh, NASCAR racetrack there. And they did it together, and then as they were finished driving 120 miles an hour around this racetrack, Gabby said, I want to do it. And yes, she got behind the wheel of a NASCAR race car, and drove it 120 miles around the track several times, the first time she'd been behind a wheel since the shooting. So this is the kind of person that I'm trying to succeed in Congress. Come on, you know, it's, it's really hard. But as you all know, she's an incredible person and doing such great work right now as we try to deal with gun violence in our country. So um, then Gabby resigned in 2012 and said, Ron, would you run? And this is where uh, I'm always reminded by Nancy of a promise I made countless times over the many years we've been together. I said, Nancy, you'll never have to worry. I will never run for office. <laughs> and uh, I said it kind of like that, too. And it was really sincere. Uh, but here I am in Congress. Who knew that this would happen? But here Gabby, I am. <laughs> so, Gabby, right, you know, it's kind, of, kind of hard to turn her down, but you were very supportive, as were my entire, with my entire family. So I've been in the Congress uh, now for uh, almost two years. It'll be two years on, uh, on June 19th, um, uh, a day before I was sworn in, a day before our anniversary, which we celebrated the, in back to front with the, uh, with the, not, with the uh, swearing in. And it's uh, been an incredible ride. I've been so honored and so privileged uh, to serve this community in this way. I've always been involved with public service from my time at Head Start to developmental disabilities to working for Gabby. I never expected to have this opportunity to serve this community that I love and that we have such deep roots in. And I'm really just, uh, I just, I can't believe that I've been given this opportunity to be hired to do this job. And, uh, I'm hoping that the people of Southern Arizona will hire me back in November of this year. We will, we'll hope. Uh, so what have we been up to for the last two years? A lot of things. Uh, you know, the Congress is often described as dysfunctional and gridlocked, and there's certainly a lot of truth to that. But in, beneath those headlines, there are actually people trying to get things done. And I'm very proud to work with people on the other side of the aisle as well as people within the, within the Democratic Caucus to try to, to get some sensible things done. We don't have too many victories, but we have some. The first time that I was able to high-five my colleagues over a victory on the floor of the House was when last year we finally, after 18 months of pushing and prodding and embarrassing uh, our colleagues who weren't willing, we passed the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women's Act. It was a great victory for women and So we want more of those, right? And sometimes the only way to get them is to actually have a majority, which we may actually do. I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, pessimistic about it at all. I think we can actually do this. And only 17. That's right. That. That, I mean, that's easy, right? We got eight last time, but you'd be able to do it. And so in that time, since I've been there, you know, we've gone across this district to every corner. I love traveling in Southern Arizona. One of the most beautiful sights uh, that you can have, if, you have if, you, if you've done this, you know, is you're coming through over the mountains and going into Bisbee, before you get to Bisbee, you have this incredible vista of the valley below, and it is absolutely stunning. And that and many other spots in this district are so beautiful, and we have to make sure we hold on to those spaces and that beauty and, and preserve it for our children and grandchildren and way beyond. Uh, we've held countless meetings uh, all across the district. As Bob mentioned, one of my biggest areas of focus is making sure that we care for our veterans. You know, they've put on the uniform, they've done what we asked them to do, and when they come home, they, they should have the commitment that we made to them when they put on that uniform. We should fulfill it. And I'm very concerned. very concerned about the, the two signature wounds of these wars that we were winding down in Afghanistan and previously in Iraq, and that's uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. These are the two injuries that many men and women are coming home with, 
it's estimated that maybe 500,000 will be dealing with these injuries uh, in, in when we finish uh, our, our time in Afghanistan. And we're not ready, and uh, we need to be ready. And then we learn sometimes that dreadful things are going on. I hope they're not true, but they appear to be solid allegations about things that are happening up in the Phoenix VA that are just uh, uh, absolutely uh, unacceptable. So fighting for the veterans is important, and I know that even though you may not agree, and any number of us may not agree on the wars that we fight, I think we can all agree that when the people who fought those wars come home, they should be treated with dignity and respect and get the services that they need. Yeah. So I've made a promise that I will do everything I can to expand benefits, to push on the VA, to close these uh, long wait lines and wait times for benefits. And actually the highest caseload of any caseload in my office, congressional office, is for veterans, uh, as it should be, because we represent 85,000 veterans in this part of the world, and uh, it's the largest, uh, it's, it's about the fifth largest congregation of of veterans in the whole country in any district. I also made a commitment to seniors, uh, and we have, as you can imagine, thousands and thousands of seniors who live here in Green Valley and Sierra Vista, and all across this beautiful district. And uh, they, I think, have a right to expect that we're going to fulfill our promise to them. You know, people say that they have entitlements to Social Security and Medicare. I don't call them entitlements at all. I think it's the wrong word. The right word is investment, because every one of the people who are drawing on Social Security or hope to, or Medicare or hope to, have been put money into that fund over their years of work. Not entitlement, it's an investment. And I want to make sure that it's kept as a guarantee when people retire. They ought to be able to be assured of economic security and health security and those two programs provide for that, and we're going to fight anyone who tries to take that away or diminish it or privatize it. And that's the way it and as we all know, the, the wage gap between people who are working people, uh, middle class people, and the people at the very top is getting wider and wider and wider every single year. And I say it's absolutely unacceptable that we should try to pass a budget, or pass a budget as we did, uh, I didn't vote for it, but we passed it out of the House, that actually increases taxes on middle class families while we give a tax break to the wealthiest people in this country. That's just wrong, and we have to make sure it doesn't happen. We're also here in, in Congress fighting for border security, smart border security not spending billions of dollars that really are wasted, but instead being smart about how we do it and making sure we listen to the people who live and work on the ground. And we have to, eventually, if it needs to be embarrassment, we have to embarrass the majority into bringing bills to the floor that will fix the broken immigration system. In our I've met with many families and young people, particularly the Dreamers, and if you have not met with some of these Dreamers, you really should. Um, I'll, I'll re re give you one story that was happened to me recently, or one an incident that was recent. Um, I was at an event, and this group of young Dreamers came up, and they said, Ron, can we pray with you? And I said, certainly. So we joined hands and prayed. And uh, after it was over, this young man came up, and he's streaming with tears, and he said, I'm a dreamer. I want to go to college. Uh, I've lived here since I was two years old. My parents brought me here. It's only been in the last recent time that I realized I wasn't an American citizen. I want to be an American citizen. I want to serve the country in every way possible. And this fear, the tears were streaming. I said, why are you crying? He said, because my grandfather, who I've only seen twice, was ill um, a half a year ago. And I couldn't go to see him, and he died without me seeing him. And those, that's, those stories are abundant. We, we have to do something about that. We have to do something about immigration reform because it's good, makes good sense economically, and it's the most humane thing to do. And one of these days, we will come to our senses, and we will actually bring it to the floor for a vote. You can certainly count on me to be strong in that. Now, 
there's, a, there's another issue that I think is very important to many of you in this room, and it should be important to you whether you're a man or a woman, and that is pay equity. You know, we have a situation in our country, even though we passed pay equity laws many years ago, that we still have, and I know people dispute this, we still have great inequity between men and women who are doing the same job. We have a 77 cent to the dollar inequity on the median income across, across the country. But when you get into individual jobs where the, the same job is being done by a man or a woman, pay inequity exists in those jobs as well. So people who try to dismiss it as saying, oh, you're comparing apples and oranges, they're really not being truthful. The truth of the matter is, and many women in this room I think could say it, and I had a round table just a few days ago where women told me this straight up, we are still dealing with pay inequity to this day. And it's still a huge problem in our country. And I'm proud to be a co-sponsor of the Paycheck Fairness Act, which will, if we get it to the floor and get it voted on and get it through the Senate and signed by the President, will once again ensure that women are treated equally in the workplace for women. <laughs> and we also have to fight for education, because as we know, that's the secret to a, a good life, a family life that uh, has some security. And we have done a miserable job, particularly in Arizona. And I know the folks behind me have worked hard to prevent it. But our state legislature somehow thinks that education is not even in the top 12 priorities. In fact, in the, over the last several years, Arizona has gone from somewhere in the 30s uh, to 51st in the nation in terms of what we pay, what we've invested in education. My kids, uh, grandkids, uh, go to public schools. My my children went to public school. I'm a product of public school, Rincon High School, and um, are you Rincon Rangers in the house? Yeah, right here. Right, here we go, Ron. Here we go. I hate crying. Um, and public school is the is the foundation of any democracy, and we are seeing it chipped away by ways of getting people, giving people money to go to private schools and all the rest, and by underfunding and defunding important parts of the educational system. We have to, we should be paying our teachers top dollar, not bottom dollar. Yeah. Um, I don't for, for so much of what happens to our kids to be competitive in this highly technological global economy that we're in. So those are some of the things, and there are more, but I'll, I'll leave the list there about the things that are important to me. I'm trying to work hard on in Congress. I am working as hard as I can to find allies on both sides of the aisle. Believe me, there are some uh, who want to do this. But let me talk about what this election is all about. It's about contrast. It's about clear differences between the two candidates. And while my opponent, my likely opponent, does have some competition in the primary, it's unlikely that, that she will be defeated. She will come into the general election, uh, as she did in 2012. And here's where we are different. The contrast could it not be more stark. She, first of all, is closely aligned with the Koch brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not only have they spent $1.3 million in funding attack ads against me since October, one of five Democrats in the country that is being targeted by the Koch brothers, but she, she got $10,000 from them in her campaign coffers the last quarter. There's no question that they are aligned, and they are aligned on some important issues that should matter to all of us. The Koch brothers want to privatize Social Security, and so has my opponent said she would like to do the same thing. Ron, why don't you call her a liar when she talks about Obamacare? It doesn't do anything. Well, it does lots of things. Call her a liar. Go on, I, I, like I, I won't like use the word liar, but we'll talk about it in other ways, perhaps. <laughs> but the other thing that's different, or that's exactly. sort of where she's aligned with the Koch brothers, is they would like to do away with the minimum wage, and so would she. And we, I mean, come on, really. We need to increase the minimum wage, not do away with it. I'm just, She said she supported the, the Ryan budget plan. Now, one of the challenges we have right now is that she's very silent about every issue, no matter what it is, other than the A-10. But that's, that's the only issue on which we hear from her. But back in 2012, she was asked by a local reporter did she support the Ryan budget. She said, well, who's Paul Ryan? 
And then about a month or so later, she said, yes, I support the Paul Ryan budget, which means that we would voucherize Medicare, which means we would tax middle class families to give tax breaks to the wealthiest people, which means that we would cut Pell Grants, slash Pell Grants for kids who want to go to school, which means we would increase or decrease the funding for uh, food stamps by several billions of dollars, and on and on and on. But today, asked if she would support it or not, she dodges the question. She said, well, it doesn't have the A-10 funding in it, so I guess I'm not for it. Well, that's not true. <laughs> um, because you don't, that's not how you fund individual items. That's, this is just a budget guideline. But that aside, that's all process. It really is about someone who will not stand up and be counted on the issues. Now, I know that some of you in the room have disagreed with me on some of the votes I've taken. I think that's probably true. But the one thing you can count on, whether you disagree with me or not, you will always know where I stand. And that's a contrast between me and my opponent. She will not tell you where she stands. We also have some differences on important social policy. And one of those has to do with a woman's right to control her reproductive health decisions. <laughs> some people will disagree with the right to choose an abortion, and some people will say it should be available to any and all women. But regardless, my view is it shouldn't be a bureaucrat, it shouldn't be a politician, it shouldn't be a governmental person telling a woman her decision to make, it should be her decision to make. And that's what she and then I, was, I was really surprised at this, but I heard it myself, so I do know it's true, and that is that back in 2012, when my opponent was running, she was interviewed on a local radio show, and uh, it was one of those moments in the car where you're trying to get out of the car and you, all of a sudden you want, you want to stay and listen to what's being said. So I stayed and listened to the answer, her answer to the question, do you believe that an employer should be able to uh, uh, not provide contraceptive services for their employees under their health care plan? And she said, absolutely, they should be able to do that because it's religious freedom. Well, we all know that that is another example of how employers who have religious views want to discriminate against other people who don't have those views, and that's wrong too, and that's where my opponent might get this wrong. And when asked recently about the, her position on marriage equality, she said, after a bit of him and the coin, that she really did not think that um, same-sex marriage was okay that the only real marriage should be between a man and a woman. Well, let me just tell you this. I am standing shoulder to shoulder with men and women in the LGBT community who, if they love someone, ought to be able to marry that person and have a full <laughs> life. So this is going to be an election filled with contrast if we can ever get my opponent to make that point. All we know really is what she said in 2012 and unless she says otherwise, we assume she still believes those same things. So here we are. We've got an outside group with multi-million dollars in their deep pockets, their dark money coming into our community trying to steal this election through a group called uh, Americans for Prosperity, very nice sounding name, or Libre Initiative, which is appealing to Latino voters in our community, who are saying over and over again the same thing. It's all about the Affordable Care Act, what they call it, Obamacare. And um, so they're trying to, if they can, to steal this election and have this trophy of the seat that was once held by Gabby Giffords and Bo Udall, and now by me. They want this seat badly, and we're going to not let. We're going to make no. sure that doesn't happen. Yeah. You know, we we have deep roots here. We welcome new people all the time. And we, we, we say, this is a community that's diverse, it's a community that's filled with people from all kinds of cold parts of our country. And we love them when they come here. I go to Green Valley often, and I usually ask the question in the Green Valley audience, how many of you are, were born in Arizona? And if I get one answer, it's usually from the guy that's the janitor, he's been here forever, but not from the people in the audience, you know? So we know that we welcome people here, and I certainly welcome my opponent here. 
But, you know, don't go telling people you're a Southern Arizona when you've been here for three and a half years, okay? okay. Um, and don't tell people you know this district when you have not been in this district. No. And don't tell people you know how what the people of this district want and need if you're a newcomer like that. I mean, I, I respect newcomers, but don't get me wrong. When you call yourself a Southern Arizona, you have to have spent more than a couple of minutes here to call yourself a Southern Arizona. <laughs> So we're a tight-knit community. As we saw on, in the aftermath of January 8, 2011, and I, I, I say this every time there's a large group of people because I really mean it and I want you to know it's still a, a deep feeling that my, fa my family and I have, and that is after that terrible day in Tucson, a little over three years ago, this community came together in the most remarkable showing of compassion and goodwill and prayer and just all that you would want for recovery and healing. Our hearts were broken. Our mental health was damaged as a community. So we came together to heal together. And I would really am so grateful to the people in this room and all the people who, who came to our house, who sent cards, who brought food, who just loved us and took care of us while we were recovering as they did all of the other survivors and the families who lost loved ones. That's this community that I want to serve well into the next uh, two or three years, and I hope you'll help me get there. So, let, me, let me wrap it up with this. You know, uh, the, this election is going to be hard fought. We won by 2,400 votes in 2012. It took 11 days to find out the end result. Um, and so it could be a tight election again. It probably will be. I mean, the district is basically one-third Democrat, one-third Republican, one-third Independent, with a, probably a slight 2%, 3% margin in, in votes, uh, in voter registration for the Republican Party. It's always been a tough district for a de Democrat, or for that matter, Republican to win, because it goes back and forth. We won't win this election unless we have you helping with the phone calls, the door knocks, the envelopes that are being sealed and sent out, and the resources that you can provide within your means to help us stay somewhat competitive with this tremendous amount of outside dark money that's coming in. We need all of that and more to win this election. This is not my election, it's our election. This is not my seat, it's your seat. And if you help me win in November, I will promise you I will serve you with as much honesty and integrity and straightforwardness as you can possibly get from a candidate or from a member of Congress. <laughs> Back in 2012, some uh, of you have heard this before, so forgive me for repeating it, but it's, it's a pretty good story and I like to tell it. Um, and that is back in 2012, there were, uh, the blogosphere was having a wonderful time with this election. We had four elections in nine months. And so it was the, for, during the special, it was a national election that everyone was looking at, because the only election going on. And uh, the blogs were having fun with calling me different names. Well, one of those names was they said, it's not really Rock Barber, it's Burl Ives. Now, how many of you remember Burl Ives? <laughs> And another one said, it's not really Ron Barber, it's Colonel Sanders. <laughs> the one I liked the most, though, was the one that said, it's not really Ron Barber, it's the professor from Jurassic Park. <laughs> well, I'll take it, because that's, he's, a, he's a sir, he's a knight, you know, from Richard Edinburgh. <laughs> but then they also said something else, and I'm going to leave you with this. They said, how is it possible that this old guy who was shot twice, can win one election, let alone four. How can he possibly win an election, let alone serve? Well, I've got news for them. We won four elections going away, and we're gonna win this one. This old guy who was shot with the help of all of you and my wonderful family, we're gonna win this election and continue in Congress.